On behalf of the principal and pro vice chancellor, Professor Yudin Barito, and the senior management, I wish to welcome you to the University of the West Indies Cable Campus for this evening's lecture. The Anthony Sapgov Awards for Excellence scheme, I find is a wonderful Caribbean institution that I first became aware of when it recognized my erstwhile boss, uh, Professor Anselm Hennis, for his sterling contributions in public health. And this was before he was elected to serve as the deputy director of the Pan American Health Organization in, in Washington, DC. The SAGBA Awards uh, for Excellence um, is the only award scheme of its kind, and I believe it deserves to be more widely known for the way it recognizes outstanding Caribbean citizens, and in so doing, helps to leverage their good works for even greater service to the citizens of the region. The Anthony uh, Sapka Caribbean Awards Program has been running for 12 years and has recognized uh, 35 exceptional Caribbean men and women in any field, from the arts, sciences, entrepreneurship, public and civic works. As part of its mission, the Sagba Caribbean Awards for Excellence includes, in addition to the granting of the awards, public education in the service of regional development. And it's in this context that this evening's public lecture is taking place, which is to share in a public forum the achievements of a laureate with the wider region. The Cavill campus is very pleased to partner in the hosting of this public lecture, which fits well with the university's own service ethos. We are certainly pleased that Professor Surish Nareen was chosen by the Anthony Sapka Caribbean Awards for Excellence as the laureate to give this public lecture on his pioneering work in green chemistry. Professor Suraj Narayan was named in 2011 as one of Canada's top 40 under 40 leaders. He is a world-renowned scientist, businessman, serial entrepreneur, and civil servant. He is considered among the world's leading figures in the generation and commercialization of green technologies. As director of Guyana's Institute of Applied Science and Technology, he is the driving force behind a collaboration with Guyana's indigenous peoples, which combines indigenous knowledges, science, and sustainable commercial commercialization. His work has led to the establishment of nationally known brands, such as Rupunumi Essence, Para Pakaraima Flavors, and the Morning Glory Breakfast Cereals. Now a senior professor of physics, astronomy, and chemistry at Trent University in Canada, where he received the Distinguished Researcher Award in 2016, Professor Narayan is also a laureate of the Anthony N. Sabga Caribbean Award for Excellence in Science and Technology 2015. He is also the executive chairman of CGX Energy, Inc., and its subsidiaries. Professor Narine is also the proud father of triplets, Ruja, Gitanjali, and Vandana. And it's so nice to be up here to introduce uh, male scientists and for them to actually mention their children. It is quite refreshing. So I would just like to take the opportunity to in, um, ask Professor Narine to come up and entertain us for the next 45 or so minutes. And thank you for that lovely introduction. I want to focus on what I consider to be five major issues or challenges that faces our region, and which I will try to convince you forms a nexus that provides a clarion call for science and technology to play that pivotal role, to be that fulcrum in providing a way forward for us. First and foremost, and these challenges, are, they're not, they don't represent any particular insight on my part. You will find that all of you know exactly what they are. And so I want to spend some time talking about why climate change does exist. I have a, a great friend, Professor Albert Binger, Jamaica. And Al Binger always says, boy, you know, this climate change thing is a real problem. The banana trees of the Caribbean just have to hear that the storm is coming, and they all lie down. So I think it's, it's in, in Al's, you know, inimitable way, what he's saying is that we are quite vulnerable as a region 
for climate change. Um, in Barbados, in many of our islands, we talk about increasing invasion of salinity as, as, as sea levels can rise. We talk about threats to flooding. We're seeing massive flooding in Trinidad. We talk about unpredictable agriculture. We're, the, the, Guyana used to have a short and long rainy season. It seems like it's either rain all year or it's drought all year. Now, some of those TV networks will argue with you that the increasing number of storms that we are seeing, the increasing number of hurricanes, have no cause and effect linkage to climate change. What is incontrovertible is that, as the graph here shows, the number of serious hurricanes has been almost monotonically increasing in the region. So climate change is, 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 is a serious matter. We all know this site very well, so let's not belabor the, the banana trees too much. What is climate change? Climate change revolves around the concept of carbon. Now, carbon in our atmosphere, first and foremost, is a good thing. Without carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, our climate would be uninhabitable, and we would all freeze to death. So the greenhouse effect really is an effect where gases like carbon dioxide sit in our atmosphere, and when solar radiation from the sun comes to Earth, those gases form an atmosphere where they trap that radiation. This allows our planet to heat up, and it allows it to be habitable, unless you live in Toronto like I do, and for most of the month you complain about it not being habitable. But, so carbon is a good thing. However, too much of a good thing is always a problem. Now, we all know that plants make tissues, it may, they make grains, they make flowers and stems and leaves using photosynthesis. And photosynthesis really is just taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in the presence of water and sunlight and making those tissues. Now by so doing, plants remove about 120 gigatons of carbon dioxide every year from the atmosphere. But they put it right back. Plants also breathe like we do, and when they do, they breathe out carbon dioxide like we do. Plants also die, and when they decay, they return the carbon that they sequestered in their leaves and their stems and their flowers and their fruit back into the atmosphere. In fact, that rate of sequestration and the rate of release is just about evenly matched, with the exception that every year, that process puts about one gigaton of carbon into the soil, beneath the sea, etc. And it is that painstaking one or two gigatons of carbon that we sequester annually that has become our reserves of oil and gas. Now, this is very important to remember because what are we doing with those reserves of oil and gas? is we're releasing them. And as we release those reserves of oil and gas, we're releasing the carbon that's sequestered in them. Also, we are deforesting our planet, and we're removing, therefore, the number of photosynthetic machines that are available to us. So our ability to sequester carbon using plants and forests is also decreasing because of our changing land use. Because of that, it turns out we're putting about six gigatons of carbon per year. That sequestered carbon over, say, 300 to 800 million years, we're putting that back at the rate of about six gigatons into the atmosphere. So therefore, we have a clear imbalance of the amount of carbon that we're sequestering and the amount that we're releasing. So there's really no mystery about climate change. It is very real and it's very measurable. And for the Caribbean, we better believe it because we're vulnerable. It is very, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but it's very, very important that we understand this and that our people who trade in futures our people who are responsible for things, worrying about things like balance of payments, our leaders and our economists begin to understand carbon 
as a commodity. Carbon is a tradable commodity. Carbon is a commodity whose futures can be bought. Because if we don't do that, we're going to be left behind. And in fact, we already are being left behind. Am I being crazy? No. Several years ago, Guyana had already negotiated several hundreds of millions of dollars of United States dollars as payment from Norway for Guyana's ability to sequester carbon. So the carbon markets is a very real thing and can have tremendous impact on economies like ours. The next challenge that the Caribbean is facing, clearly, is expensive energy. Now, we're all sitting in the Caribbean, and I'm wearing a woolen jacket, and we're all sitting here, and some of the ladies are wearing cardigans and scarves because we're chilling this room to very unnatural temperatures. So we have a problem. We're very profligate with our use of energy in the Caribbean. But that energy is also expensive. And where else do we know that more than Barbados, right? Last week in the newspapers, Barbados is paying the third highest cost for petrol at the pumps. Third highest, little Barbados. But this is a, this is a problem. And here's the, the, the problem also. The region's use of energy has also been monotonically increasing. It's an inexorable gluttony for energy. And it's unavoidable. There's no need to feel abashed about it because the, the, the act of living in today's world means consumption of energy. And the prediction, of course, is that it will continue to rise at that kind of tra trajectory. Here's the problem. Our region is a net importer of petroleum. Okay, other than Trinidad and Tobago, Suriname, and actually a very small amount from Barbados, the region doesn't produce energy. Of course, Guyana has just announced 4 billion barrels of reserves and counting, and so that will change the balance a little bit. But it does not change the balance in the context of the Caribbean because the Caribbean has stubbornly refused to acknowledge that it's an archipelago with individual countries which are unsustainable because of their size and populations. So when one country does well, the region doesn't do well. When Trinidad was king, Guyana sat there with rice that it couldn't sell in the open market, and Trinidad imported rice. This is the kind of silliness that the Caribbean does. And I'll be talking a little bit more about this silliness because it's time we build the cat because the region is unsustainable unless the region collaborates and cooperates. But energy, energy is a problem. We're a net importer. Now, look at what we do. The Caribbean relies on petroleum for 80% of its energy demand, 80%. That is not so with the rest of the world. So we lag the world, we are importing this stuff we don't produce this stuff, and we don't seek alternative ways of generating the electricity we need. But I see that as an opportunity. Look at the amount of generation capacity that exists in, in Caribbean countries. Clearly, clearly, if we had science-minded, technology-minded, entrepreneurial people, we'd be addressing we'd be addressing this lack of renewable generational capacity in the Caribbean. So I see that as a tremendous opportunity for science and technologists and entrepreneurs. In fact, it's, it's very lamentable. If you look at Latin America and the Caribbean, only 4% of the total announcements of foreign direct investment in renewable energy received, was received by the Caribbean in 2017. That's an indictable number. That's a scary, scary, scary number. Because what it means, the countries are paying, Barbados is certainly paying a serious price for energy. There's nothing wrong with Barbados's money for energy. It has a huge opportunity to convert its petroleum use into renewable energies. Yet the foreign direct investment hasn't landed on Barbados shores to make that transition. We have to ask ourselves why. 
part of the reason I wish to suggest is that we don't, we have not spent the time to develop our knowledge, absorptive capacity, and labor related to science and technology. So foreign direct investment dollars do not find absorptive capacity here and in Guyana and in Suriname and in all of our Caribbean countries in order to land here in those areas. But it gets worse. In Barbados alone, and I'm not picking on Barbados, I thought I'd better show some numbers for Barbados since I'm here. Um, but this is really true across most of the Caribbean. 48% of the electricity consumption in Barbados hotels are for air conditioning. Now, I've stayed over the years at maybe six or seven hotels. Not a single one of those hotels had simple measures like you put your key into a slot and the air conditioning comes on. You leave, you take your key out, and you save on air conditioning. Simple, simple interventions we are not using in the Caribbean. What I see there, absorptive capacity. I see opportunities for entrepreneurs. I see opportunity for science-minded, technology-minded people. Am I beginning to sound like a broken record? Yes, because we don't do it. Why don't we do it? Because we don't have the people who are trained and attuned to that. And, you know, it's, and in, so, in some of these cases, it's really not about reinventing the wheel. It's not about finding solutions. The solutions are there. It's simply about technology transfer. And, and lest we forget, electricity and access to electricity per capita is directly proportional to human development indices. Those countries at the top of the United Nations Human Development Index are all countries that have significant access per capita to electricity. Electricity to manufacture, electricity for leisure, electricity for our art and for our music and for our lifestyles. So climate change, expensive energy. The next one is food security. Well, you all know this, right? This is in the news all the time. The Caribbean has a crippling dependency on imported food. Look at these numbers. These are scary, scary, scary numbers. The graph on, the, on, my, on my right and your left um, are real numbers. That's what we pay for food right now. 4.5 billion US dollars annually. That's what we pay for food right now. And look at the graph on your right. That's what we're going to pay for food if we keep the trajectory. How are we going to do this? How are we going to pay for this food? If it's not a question that we're grappling with, then I think we've buried our heads in the sand. What is our productive capacity? We dropped in productive capacity in 2005, agricultural productive capacity, and we've never, ever gotten back on that horse, ever. We've percolated at the same levels, practically, since 2005 for production, whilst, don't forget, our demand for food and agriculture has increased almost exponentially. So there's something wrong. We have a mismatch. And then on the other, the other graph, it lists the things that we import most. Now look at these things, ladies and gentlemen, and tell me that if we injected a bit of science and technology into our agriculture, we could not be producing those things. There's not a single systemic natural resource reason why any of those things cannot be produced in the Caribbean. You can't say, well, we don't have steel. You can't say that we don't have platinum. You can't say that we don't have silver. These are things that we have. Arable land, fresh water, sunlight, a growing season which outstrips the growing season of the smallest country in the world with the largest efficiency of agriculture, the Netherlands. And we can't do it here. It's because, again, we do not have a culture of science and technology applied to production. So, climate change, energy, food. The next one is labor. Lovely to hear that the University of West Indies and well-deserved applause in finding its way into the top 5%, number 34 in Latin America and the Caribbean. That is remarkable. But 
we're still not reaching and educating all of our people. This is not leveling anything at UWI. In the Caribbean, our institutions, with the exception of UWI in three countries, are fractured. They don't collaborate with each other. They don't have, well, they do collaborate, but not very effectively. They don't have common uh, standards. They don't have common curricula. You've got very sort of siloed approaches to education. And we only have 16 and a half million people in the English-speaking Caribbean. So this fractured way, this fractured, almost fractious way of operating in the Caribbean is leading to exacerbations in global trends. What are the, now let's look at this, for example. These are tourism numbers. These are how, how many people each country in the Caribbean employed in the tourism industry. With the exception of Guyana and Trinidad and Haiti, almost all of those countries are in double figures and many of them are over 50%. Now, I have no problem with tourism. I love tourism. <laughs> I love being in Barbados. I mean, who wouldn't if you have to go back to Toronto? But um, what kind of jobs do we have in tourism, ladies and gentlemen? Who owns the capital in tourism? To where does the generation of wealth flow in tourism? How much of it leaves the shores of the Caribbean? How much of it trickles down into real economic impact into the Caribbean? And by having our people focused on tourism, what, what is the opportunity cost? What is that opportunity cost? Could they have been the next crop pathologist? Could they have been the next solar specialist? Could they have been the scientist that figures out how to effectively and pragmatically harness sargassum from our beaches? And what about the returns on that investment? I'm here to tell you, those returns are much more rewarding. And so we must wean ourselves off of jobs at the bottom of the economic ladder where the capital and the wealth is owned by an expatriate system. No, I'm not an anarchist, but I'm a realist. And it's very important to examine these things. But here's what's happening with the world. In the majority of the world's major economic powers, the United States, but let's say North America and Western Europe, Japan, the birth rate has not been up to the demand for productivity. So in all of those countries, what we have is a serious and severe labor shortage in about five years to one decade. Crippling labor shortage in terms of skilled labor. In fact, the only place in the world where we have an excess of labor is in sub-Saharan Africa, which is afflicted by 60% AIDS and a great level of grade three education. Where's that skilled labor going to come from? Well, many of it is taken from you. The few scientists that we produce in the Caribbean, there are two ways you can live in North America, you know, if you don't have relatives to sponsor you. There are two ways. One of those ways is you have intellectual capital, and the second way is you have financial capital. So if you have money to invest, you can self-sponsor. And if you have an advanced degree in areas like science and technology and STEM, you can go to Canada. Why does this make sense? Because Canada needs skilled people. So as fast as we can produce them, if we don't have the systems and the absorptive, and again, we were talking about this just minutes ago, absorptive capacity here, those jobs, those people leave. So labor, labor is a significant problem, and it has to start with Caribbean integration. It has to start with a policy-driven investment in STEM education. I was just talking to Dr. Landis. He told me his, his science department building is 60 years old. Well, it was built in the 1960s. Badly needs to be rebuilt. We should be rebuilding that. Okay. So four of the, of the five things, right? Climate change, energy, labor, food. The last one I want to talk about is foreign direct investment. All of these countries share a common disaster in terms of their origins. All of us. All of us started our lives as 
colonies with slaves and indentured laborers who were not brought here to create countries, as to take to steal something from Mr. Ramcharitar. They were brought here to live in plantations divided in order to, in a lovely Guyanese book by uh, Dr. Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, fits extremely well into the context of the Caribbean. But here we are. We've emerged out of this common disaster, and we're this collection of nations in the Caribbean archipelago. We have low GDP. We have no plantocracy with large amounts of money and capital to invest in us. So this region needs foreign direct investment. There's no other way. We don't have the money. We've got to attract that money. How are we going to attract that money? We've got to have the right kinds of labor, the right kinds of ideas, the right kind of innovation. This is the reality of our foreign direct investment. And you know, sometimes the newspapers say all kinds of silly things. The reality is, if you look, the, the most important point here is the graph here. This is Guyana, Barbados, Jamaica, and Trinidad, foreign direct investment since 2011, CARICOM as a whole, and then the percentage of CARICOM divided by the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean, and the percentage of CARICOM divided by the world. We exist at a 0.22%, 0.22%. That means 0 0.0022, absolutely, of the amount of foreign direct investment in the world. It means that the amount of foreign direct investment that comes into this region is a trickle. It's minuscule. And it's minuscule also all of the foreign investment that comes into this part of the world is greenfield, meaning that it comes in and starts something new. Why does it have to start something new? Because we are not creating our own innovation-led opportunities here that can then get acquired or merged. So they're not by mergers or acquisitions, they're greenfield investments. And that's an indicting, indicting figure as well. Well, I moved to Ontario. Ontario's got a human development index of about 9.25, right? Um, almost uh, 0.3 ahead of the Caribbean. The GDP per capita of CARICOM is about 6,400 US dollars. In Ontario, it's about 60,000 US dollars. That's a big, big gap, right? Look at the foreign direct investment. Ontario has three times the foreign direct investment of the CARICOM countries. And why am I comparing them? They have almost similar populations. Similar populations. Ontario, however, is not fractured. Ontario has 23 universities. We have maybe five. Ontario's universities have to adhere to a provincial standards, ours don't. Ontario universities must collaborate in order to get funding, ours doesn't. Do you begin to see some challenges here? So, I want to suggest then that in the balance of the issues that we have, unskilled labor, untrained labor, financial crises, low FDI, energy insecurity, profligate approach to energy consumption, food insecurity, and the looming, gloomy world of climate change, I want to suggest that one very compelling way of addressing this is having a population that understands science, adopts scientific uh, solutions, and has absorptive capacity for innovation-driven entrepreneurship. We need to develop a cadre of skilled labor for emerging industries in the food, energy, and higher value sustainable space. And it's not okay to just grow food. We must value add food. We must add value to that food at home. At home. Because shipping commodities means a race to the bottom. And all of the wealth leaves the shores of the Caribbean. Technology and science can be a great leveler of the proverbial playing field. It can allow us access to high-paying, innovative jobs and businesses simply because we're skilled, simply because we're skilled. It's a great way of climbing up the ladder without having to have 
very wealthy parents. I can tell you, I grew up in an extremely poor society and I've brought 46 companies to market in science and technology. Well, not all of them did well, but so, enough of them did well that I can still, I can still drive what I want. Um, so it's, it's important, it's important. Um, if we make it accessible in all, in our, in our tertiary institutions, it can be transformative because it will create a critical mass. It can lead to increasing foreign direct investment as a function of the acquisition of technology startups. It can provide the skilled labor needed to encourage innovation-led investments. And it can focus on high value rather than commodities. I want to argue with you that our tourism product is a commodity. Every single time, every single time Europe catches a cold, Barbados is strung out. Barbados gets leukemia, okay? Because those tourist dollars don't come. We have no control over when Europe catches a cold. Do we really want to continue to depend on 50% of our employment? I mean regionally, on tourism. So we have to match science and technology with investment, but let's not forget that we are an archipelago of only 16 and a half million souls. No single country in this region has the critical mass to do it on our own. But I make this call if we don't start to begin to have some sort of federation, some sort of policy-driven collaboration, give up, go home. 750,000 people in Guyana will not compete no matter how much oil and gas they have. Cannot. They're the size of a small city in the US, right? No absorptive capacity. We need to look at governance. We need to be careful about how we invest, and we need, by all means, to avoid the scourge of corruption. Small societies in small islands like ours lead, lend themselves to corruption of all sorts. All sorts. And, and we are a particularly bad region for that. So we, we need to look at it. However, having said all that, I am an optimist. I believe that the future is bright because it's about choices. And choices is about information. And choices is about making informed decisions. Not simply by blindly following something because somebody is scaremongering, but by making informed decisions. So we've got to make informed choices. We've got to make informed choices, and we have to do. We just can't plan, right? The second thing is make no small plans because small plans lack the will to stir people's slow souls. If at all you're going to do something, do it because it's grandiose and it's fun and you can put all of your energy into it. Yeah? Do it because the Caribbean is a special place. Do it because we live here. So let me talk to you now about some doing things. And this is the fun part of my presentation. I have lots of pictures. So for the past 15 years, I've had the distinct honor and pleasure of being the director, whilst I was still a professor in Canada, of being the director of Guyana's Institute of Applied Science and Technology. And if I had to die after I leave here, this would undoubtedly be the one thing that has fed my soul. I want to share this with you because it underscores with all of the talks and graphs that I can throw at you, what I, want, what I share with you now will convince you, I hope, that science and technology does stir people's souls and reach people. So this is the building that we do many of these things in. And 15 years ago, I've worked and reported to three presidents of Guyana from across the political spectrum. And every single one of them has underscored the importance of investments in science and technology. So first we set about building a state-of-the-art laboratory. The laboratory that we have there is second to none in the Caribbean and probably among the top three in South America, in a narrow area. So we built good instrumentation. It's important when you invest in science that you don't buy equipment just because it's cheap. You've got to buy the best and you've got to train people to the best standards. And yes, 
Maintaining skilled labor has been one of the largest challenges that I've had. For example, this is a white blade distillation unit. It was the, it's the, two years ago, it was the only of its kind in the entire region, Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, how do you think you go, what happens when you go to cabinet and they have teenage pregnancy issues and they have suicide issues and they have a growing poverty population? And you say to them, buy me a machine that goes ping. I want the machine that goes ping. And that machine is 300,000 euros. Just buy it for me. Trust me. It ain't going to happen. Doesn't happen. Right? So scientists in the room, you've got to find ways of getting the politicians on side. And I've tried everything under the sun. I've threatened them. I've threatened to write them up. I've gone and camped out on their doorstep. I've gone to their fundraisers and belaguered them. I've befriended their children. I've done all kinds of things. But you need to get them to listen because it can really, really work. Okay, so these are some of the equipment that we have. And don't just do science in test tubes. Do science that you can scale up. Do science that you can reach people with. I, I you know, I, I published a fair bit and I tell you, Another publication for me has nothing on the look on a child's eyes whose community you've had an impact on. So let's talk about some of those things. So this is called the Rupununi Essence Project. Um, and this is where this project was located. These are high savannas. Ghana has four geographic regions, a narrow, low coastal plain where most of the agriculture happens and most of the people live. It's dirty and it's crowded and I don't like it. And then it goes into the hilly sand and clay areas and into the rainforests, high savannas, and then mountains. Now, the high savannas are very interesting places, altitudinally very high. They're bounded by the rainforest and the mountains. So they are areas where weather is made. And in those areas, you can have extreme drought or you can have extreme floods. And somehow, in the middle of that, People that have lived there have learned to live there in beauty, in harmony, in art. They've learned how to be healthy, and they've learned how to have good governance. So what I'm saying is place matters. When somebody works and lives and thrives in a place, listen to what they have to offer because they've figured it out. So this environment alone, you know, who here is old enough to remember Conan Doyle? Some of you. Raymond, don't put up your hand, it's shameful. Um, but you know, Conan Doyle wrote his the, the Land That Time Forgot based on this landscape. It's a desolate, beautiful, remarkable place. And in this place, there's very small villages. Guyana has nine peoples, indigenous peoples, and these peoples are called the Makushis. The Makushis, in this small village of Anai, of about 600 people, live and have learned to live in these high savannas. They live in what we would consider paradise, but there's very little economic activity. The main road to any kind of market becomes impassable and takes about 11 hours and is very costly. So if you want to do agriculture and you want to bring it to market, forget it, it's going to spoil. And the cost of bringing it there, the cost of that, that expensive fuel is prohibitive. Yeah. Um, they speak their language, they speak Makushi. English is their second language and Portuguese a third. But they have a kind of new knowledge, not an N-E-W, a K-N-E-W. They have this 7,000 years of anthropological medicine, 7,000 years of cosmeceutical knowledge. 7,000 years of knowledge what to do when the baby is breached and you can't go anywhere to find a doctor. 7,000 years of that. And that's a remarkable treasure trove. Medicines, cosmetics, governance, music, culture, and beauty, and other things. And we felt it was important to marry science to that knowledge and see what we get. So, of course, we had to start looking at intellectual property which is one of the things the Caribbean lags the rest of the world in. 
Even our intellectual property offices are not careful about protecting our people's intellectual property. So we've got to put that in the list to fix. But we went to them and we worked with the minister in charge and the ministry in charge. And we, we said, we don't want any of the, your intellectual property. Let us agree right now that everything we do with you, you will own. Right away, off the bat. No negotiation. You own it. It's your history. And that worked. We have a process called FOIP, uh, not FOIP, um, Free and Informed pri Prior Consent. Oh, I don't, I can't remember what the, the acronym is. Um, but it means that when you do these things, you become less of a scientist and more of a diplomat. And I'll tell you a story about the cultural diplomacy that you have to do later. I think you get a kick out of it. We found this group of women who called themselves the Makushi Research Unit. And among other things, they were putting grammar. No, no, think of this. German philosopher called Wittgenstein wrote a treatise called the Protractus on the inability of ideas to be communicated without language. If you don't have a word to describe what you feel and think and is within you, then does it exist? Does that thing exist? How do you say it to somebody, right? Now imagine what happens when you've got seven, 20,000 years of knowledge in a language and that language is no longer accessible. What happens to that knowledge? Do we lose it? It isn't written anywhere. So these ladies, these ladies were compiling a book of Makushi grammar and words so that that knowledge wouldn't be lost. And in so doing, they were recording the anthropological history of their people. And buried in there were all of these medicines and cosmetics. So we were absolutely delighted to find them. Um, for thousands of years, they've known that the pods from this tree, this rainforest tree, which grows in the thick rainforest, and its wood is actually prized as a, as a type of dark mahogany, but that the pods in the rainy season, the pods from this tree falls and, and the rainforest floods, and these pods find their way into the streams. The Amerindians go and they pick up these pods in their canoes, and they leave the pods sitting on a piece of ground for about 21 days. And it's always 21 or 22 days, and it's always one type of the year. And of course they ferment. After they, they fermented, they put them into a wicker type of extraction device, and they extract an oil. And that oil, they use as an antiviral, they use as an emollient, they use as an antibacterial, and I don't know if you've ever seen a Makushi person, but they have absolutely lovely skin. Um, they've been using this oil all the time. They live in some of the harshest places of the world where the insects are not easy. And these people are not scratching and itching. And it's because of this crabwood oil. So we figured that what we would do is marry some modern science to this. We took it, we found that the oil had 10% vitamin E, for example. We found that the oil was chock full of limonoids, so it was antibacterial and antiviral. We found that the solid profile of the oil was exactly the solid profile that you get out of shea butter and cocoa butter. So we realized what we had in our hands was a cosmetic. And they, they knew this. They were making some soaps. These were some of the first soaps. They were full of alkali. They had way too much sodium hydroxide. You would not want to use these soaps, right? But they were making them. And so we brought them to the Institute, and they taught us about the oil, and we taught them about how to do science. And here's, here's some of them in the lab. We also ensured that we got the kids involved so that the young school leavers could be trained. And they started making much better soaps, like these. And then we started to work with the formulation. Now we started injecting marketing. We asked, what were the entrants? What do people look for? Well, cosmetic facial cleansers, nobody wants now to have a solid piece of soap because you use it and it's done. You know, you set it down on the sink and it slides off. 
Where it's at is in liquid soap. Well, I got excited because liquid soap tells me I can sell water. Whenever you can sell water, you're doing good business. So we went off and we found a way to make liquid soap. And then we went to the government and squatted on their doorstep until they bought us the equipment. Right? So now, now we had state-of-the-art equipment and we could make this. Now a major distributor in North America now carries this line. And this is now a household name in Guyana and hopefully going to become a household name in the Caribbean. It's quality controlled to the nth degree. It's always the same viscosity. It always smells the same. The color is always the same. It always looks the same. It's in fact marrying modern science and good manufacturing practices with indigenous knowledge. And we, we like to think that the packaging is also pretty special. Um, and we've done uh, a lot of rainforest themes, demonstration of the product. We are also replanting the trees. So these are being replanted in the savannas because there was a massive amount of logging done before on them. And now a, a logger now collects pods. It is more lucrative for a logger in this community to not cut trees down, but to collect pods. So it's good for the climate, it's good for climate change, and it's also good for their pockets. So that's Rupununi Essence. I want to take you through another one. We call this the Pacarima Flavors Project. This is another community. This, Guyana's highlands are characterized by these tall mountains with flat tops. We call them tepuis. Now, tepuis are very interesting places because they have steep sides. They tend to have very protected biodiversity, which we'll talk about after. But here's a community called Paramakatoi. Paramakatoi is named after a stream. And they have some surrounding communities of Bamboo Creek. Lovely names, these. Yawong. Yawong means from the mountain, right? These are lovely, lovely names. Um, here's the almost dirt airstrip that you have to use to get in. You fly about an hour and a half from Georgetown to get there. Um, it's, we call it the Pacaraima Highlands because it's in the Pacaraima range of mountains. And it's about 970 meters above sea level, heavily forested, and clearly not very populated. Um, it's about 3,500 individuals in those communities. And these are Patamona peoples now, a different type of people. Um, and they speak Patamona English and Portuguese. Everybody's close to the Brazilian border. I mean, this really is the land that time forgot, right? Most of the people here subsist by farming. Everybody farms, so nobody can sell farming produce to the next person, right? How do you buy shoes? You can eat. How do you buy clothes? How do you buy shoes? How do you buy a computer? How do you get a satellite dish to get internet? How do you home grow your own doctors? How about jurisprudence? You think we can grow a lawyer here? It's a challenging place. It's a very challenging place. So what happens with these places is they develop a culture of dependence. They develop a culture of handouts. Proud people. It takes remarkable resilience and strength to live in an environment like this and have dignity. And yet those proud people, because of a lack of economic opportunities, become people that expect handouts. This drove me nuts. And not just me, but many others that joined me in the, in, in, in the effort. And this is, how, this is how people live in the village. They all do sustainable farming. What they will do is they'll, you know, if you read the books from Europe, they'll tell you slashing and burning the forest is horrible. Well, yes, it's horrible if you have overpopulation. But if you have 3,500 people and they burn a spot, they plant and then they move. They never plant in the same spot again. You come back next year and the forest has regenerated. It's actually the best way of doing forest agriculture. Um, farms are typically remoted on the remote fertile slopes of the mountains where you get all the runoff. And look at how, look, that's a sweet pepper. In the Caribbean, we call that tree a force ripe. There's a plague, a big man and making fruit. There's a little, little tree. But this is what you see in the region, in this region. It's really remarkable. And that's no fertilizer. 
The entire region is organic. The, look, look at that. Look, look at the fruit on that tree. Hardly ever see that on the coast. So, but this is very far. When the rains are, are it, when, when it's not raining, it takes three days in a four by four crawling across the mountains to come to Georgetown. No markets are available. You can grow it, but you can watch it rot. You can't fly it out. It's too expensive. So we thought, what could we do? Could we preserve? And by preserving, can we add value? So we decided, yes, sun-dried tomatoes. Let's see if we can grow tomatoes. So we started growing tomatoes. We organized a cooperative. We said to them, invest in us. Let us make sun-dried tomatoes. We will pay you a pittance for them. Allow us to bring them to Georgetown because now they're shelf stable. We can wait until the rains are gone. And we've lost 90% of their weight because we drove off the water. They're dried now. They have a better flavor profile. So you can throw them on a truck and you can take two months to get out. It's just fine. They're just entirely stable. And we've just added value because you go down to the Hilton They'll charge you four times the amount for sun-dried tomato salad dressings than they will for just oil and vinegar, right? So we, 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 we started this process and we got the community very, very interested. Here you can see the tomatoes without pesticides, without fertilizer growing. Um, this fence is now in a compound that did not exist. This was ball rainforest. So we went into a mountain and we convinced the government to give us the money to do this. You know, what's remarkable about this job is I get to do these things, right? We don't get a contractor. We go over there, and the institute staff gets a shovel. So it's been, it's been really a remarkable journey. I'm showing you lots of pictures of tomatoes, right? But look, look at those tomatoes. Can you imagine growing that without fertilizer? So this is the compound we made. The, the buildings were all made with wood from the forests that we knocked down, so they were cheap. The village chipped in and helped, and we got a few skilled people that we paid, a few contractors, and we built a dormitory, a processing center, and a solar drive. Very simple things. We actually got the president of the country, who's unfortunately um, now ill in Cuba, so um, we wish him well. This was the Canadian um, High Commissioner at the time. We got the Canadians to throw some money in. We got the president to throw some money in. These are a few ministers, so, you know, they all give us money, so we put them in the picture. Sorry? And yes, and this person deserves mention. This was one of the very, very early Sabga laureates, Sidney Alicock, who is now the country's first indigenous person that became a vice president, and also is the Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs. So the Sabga family was very much involved here as well. Here, this is the facility. Um, we have this food processing center, a dormitory so that the people from Georgetown who come up to help can stay. We power the entire thing with solar panels, so no, no diesel, no expensive petroleum. And here's a solar dryer made from wood. The only thing imported here is a special plastic. Everything else is made right here. Here are some pictures of the, farm, farmers, the farmers' names are on each of the little baskets. And these you can buy for two bucks at the corner store, right? Very, very, very appropriate technology. They're all graded and weighed, so everybody can, can be counted for. See, Jeanette Thomas there supplied those. And then it's first in, first out, so we don't have any spoilage. Um, they're, pro they're washed, and then they're washed with, uh, with salt and sliced. Very simple. They're then drained, and they go into the solar dryer. And then they get dehydrated. And they're ready. That's what the sun-dried tomatoes look like when they're dried. And then they're packaged in polyurethane bags, and they can wait for months and years in, until we can afford to bring them out to the coast. And on the coast, we got the politicians again to pay for state-of-the-art equipment. So now we bring those to the coast and we convert them into salad dressings and ketchup. 
And yes, we didn't ignore the good packaging either, right? And they're all sealed, so when you get them, they're, they're no difference between what you buy from Heinz and others. Um, and they're done with good manufacturing practice. By the way, all of the youngsters in this, these pictures are Patamonas from that community. So this way, we're also transferring the skills into the community. That's what the finished products look like. It just goes to show if you inject appropriate technology, appropriate science into communities, you can have transformative effects. Both of those products, all of the proceeds go back into those communities, and they're having a tremendous impact on their spending power, on their, on their health care, on their education. But let me talk to you a little bit quickly. I have a few more to show you about cultural diplomacy. So, you know, I live in Toronto. One of my PhDs is in food science. So I'm all about, you know, the right thing, right? You can't, you've got to have protocol. You've got to shower when you get into the, into the facility, take all your clothes off, put on whites, hair nets, beard nets, no, no earrings, no fingerings. We don't want somebody's earring ending up in the product. Well, everybody was happy, but they all squatted outside. They wouldn't go to work. And they wouldn't tell me why they wouldn't go to work. So it took a couple of days of sitting around and talking to people. And finally, somebody said to me, you know, if they shower, they can't hunt because the animals can smell them. Now, I had no clue. I don't hunt, so I don't know, right? So it was a simple fix. All we had to do was get scentless soap. And then everybody was working happily. So in these things, you can't approach them like a general. You have to be a gardener. You have to learn. You have to water. You have to fix, right? And that's where the social part of being a scientist is so important. Another, another little story. Um, Let's call him George. George worked for three weeks. George wanted a pair of sneakers. So to the Amerindian, who, the idea of a fence is foreign. They're not avaricious in their culture. So he got his pair of sneakers. He took off. A month later, George comes back. And I said, George, where were you? Well, he says, we come back from a walk. So I said, what do you mean? You, you left the job, clearly. Where were you? I went over there. He, he had gone a trek of one week away to Brazil to visit his relatives, and he walked back. I said, but I don't understand this. He said, well, I needed a pair of sneakers to go visit my relatives. I went. I worked. I got the money. I went. I came back. Now I need something else. Right? Now, is George right or am I right? I decided that George was right. So now for every job at the facility, we hire three people. If they all want to work, they share the work. But if they want to go hunt and they want to go to Brazil or they want to do whatever, go do it. We have somebody else. And it works. So this whole cultural diplomacy is very, very important if you want to be respectful. Right? So um, just some more images. I'm going to go through them quickly because I want to show you something else. I want to talk to you about this one, right? So these are all commercial products on supermarket shelves that science enabled, right? That is having impact, that has market share. So we call this Morning Glory rice. We built this in the middle of the coast, in the middle of a rice growing region. And we built it because 30% of all the rice grown in Guyana and milled ends up as broken rice. And that rice ends up in chicken feed and at a, as a devalued product. At the same time, the communities here um, had no employment. So, so we decided to, we spent about six years actually in the lab developing these products and, and investing in extrusion technology. And finally, and I'm not going to show you all that. I, I just want to show you the end products. So... Thank you. Um, they're on shelves. And as you can see, they're well packaged. They're holding their own. And they're actually being distributed by Ansa McCall in Guyana. Um, they, have, you know, they, they hold their own very well against the, the world's brands. And we've gotten some good shelf space. Um, we do a lot of taste tests. 
There you can see them among other things that you know well. Let's not call their names. Here's our official ad that you see in, in, on the television. In it's very short. Every day is a fresh start to live better. And Morning Glory breakfast cereal gives you more than a great start for the day ahead. It's fiber rich, so you'll stay fuller for longer. Made with whole grains, which are vital for our body's health and maintenance. Enriched with the right combination of minerals and vitamins. And available in our all natural molasses flavor. All from the golden rice fields of Guyana to prepare you for even the most challenging of days at work, school, or play. So savor the taste, enjoy the energy and live healthy with Morning Glory Breakfast Cereal, developed and produced by the Institute of Applied Science and Technology without compromise to quality and distributed by Hansa Macal Trading Limited. I'm going to leave you with one last product that we worked, we are working on and we have launched. We just launched this in October. Now, one of the things that we want to do is we want to move up the value chain. And again, with another Sadga laureate, um, Sidney Alicock, we had gone to the rainforest and we're having a good time. And um, we're having a good time because they give us this, this drink to drink called uh, Fly. Oh, Fly is a little bit alco alcoholic. And so we were quite, you know, that, that, that libation was, was, the tongues were flowing. And um, I said to Sidney, you know, this is really neat. We should try to sell this. This is better than beer. And he said, well, you know, there's more to this than just as a source of alcohol, that we use this as a tonic. In fact, when, when women are, are pregnant, we will give them this to drink. Um, and when people are suffering from various ailments, we'd give them to drink. Uh, it turns out that this product, is, this, this fly, is made from a type of sweet potato. These sweet potatoes are absolutely deep purple. And the strains found in the high pacaraimas and those tipuis seems to be particularly purple. So, you know, whenever you find a fruit or vegetable that has a color, it means that it has a compound in it that absorbs light. So we wanted to know what was absorbing this light. So we analyzed it. And lo and behold, we found that these purple potatoes had just about the highest levels of anthocyanins found in any other natural products. In fact, they were full of the, the anthocyanin that's particularly efficacious in lowering blood pressure um, and targeting free radicals in the body and therefore being anti-carcinogenic. Uh, that anthocyanin is called cyanidin and it's bright purple. So we realized that we had a winner on our hands here. And we went ahead and we we did, you know, about uh, two or three years of research. And how do you how do you take these purple potatoes? How do you immobilize the enzymes that leads them to forming alcohol? So stop the fermentation. Um, and then how do you make it into a drink where we can bring across the anthocyanins so you have maximum percentage of anthocyanins in the drink, without um, impacting taste, without impacting um, shelf life, without impacting flavor um, and, and without impacting viscosity, right? This is, a, this is a, a significant challenge to the scientist, right? So it was a lot of fun, but it turned into this thing. Well, we had some fun with this because one of the most successful drugs ever really invented is what? Viagra, right? I kid you not, Viagra had the fastest payback in terms of return on investment in the recorded history of discovered drugs. Amazing thing. How does Viagra work? Viagra works by increasing circulation. It's very simple. Guess how anthocyanins work? They also work by increasing circulation. So this is how we branded it. <laughs> we, we, we said purple is the new blue, right? Um, but, but also, we layered on top of it um, the PAHO recommended vitamin profile. We ensured that we were reducing the amount of sugar. So if you drink this drink, it's very tasty. It's very refreshing. It's nutritional. And it's not full of sugar, right? And of course, like everything else, it's well packaged. Those are the purple potatoes that I told you about. 
The response to this drink has been absolutely remarkable. And of course, it's targeted at a higher value, right? So this drink is targeted at the Lucozade and the Gatorade market, right? So now we've gone way up in value in terms of the product offering. Um, the, the nutritional profile, we're able to call it a heart healthy um, antioxidant. We're able to claim the vitamin. So we're moving up that health claim value chain. And this is what you have to do. When you have a limited no labor force, you, your, your absorptive capacity in the soil, you want to have to be low. You don't want to have massive deforestation. Then you've got to call a higher margin of prices for your products in order to, 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 to balance it off. And so um, SAC was born. Now, SAC is the Patamona word for sweet potato, right? If you look at the Pacaraima flavors packaging, it says Wukpong. Wukpong is a Patamona word for from the mountain. Pong is mountain. Yawong, Wukpong. In the, in, in, in the Rupununi essence as well, and they all refer to names of places. So Rupununi is a place. Why? Blue Mountain Coffee is now a patented thing. Geographical indication patenting. So we can patent Rupununi essence because it's from a place. We can patent Pakaraima flavors because it's from a place. We don't have to go and claim the expensive clinical trials we need to do to show efficacy in clinicals, we can patent and protect that right off the bat by calling it SAC because that's a patent word. So you've got to be also careful in how you approach your unique value proposition when you do these things. Those are only four products. This tiny institute has only 16 staff members who are scientists, one six. None of them other than me has a PhD. All of them are Guyanese. All of them are 200% committed. All of them have learned to look at science in the test tube all the way through to markets. We run these companies as separate business units. The cereal is already doing a 28 to 30% return on investment. Every single other product is in the blue. What is happening? Why did I choose this title? I could have come and talked to you about green chemistry. We're doing some really cool stuff. We're using, you know, click chemistry to do some remarkable things. But that doesn't stir souls. These things do. These things do. And in the Caribbean, we're the right level for science to have impact. So I hope that I've stolen a part of your Thursday, but that when you leave, you'll spare a thought. What can be? I thank you for listening. I thank Anthony N. Sabga Foundation for inviting me, University of West Indies for hosting this lecture, and you most of all, and those of our online listeners for tuning in and showing up. Thank you so much. <laughs>